It comes down to the world's view of politics being, I, I'm right and, and you're wrong. Welcome back tonight, and hope you're all feeling okay. Yeah? yeah? All right. Let's, let's start with a word of prayer tonight. Um, Father in heaven, uh, Lord, we do uh, come to you this evening grateful that we're able to, uh, grateful for your word to us, grateful for the, the guidance that it gives us in life. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for the relationship that we have with you through, through faith in Jesus Christ and your spirit that indwells us now that can help us, that can teach us uh, from your word. And as we look at, a, I think, a very timely topic tonight, I just pray that your spirit would teach us. I pray that you might convict us in some areas that perhaps we need to be convicted in, uh, remind us of some some things concerning uh, this topic that I, I, I can't help but think, I, I know I've heard before, but just need this reminder and reemphasis, Lord. Thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, well, tonight's topic is politics. And, and you know, I, I'll just tell you right now, it, it, it's more about as we get to the end of this, this lesson tonight, more about responding to politicians and policies. Um, we're not going to, I mean, there's, there's a million different things that we could talk about concerning politics, but tonight is gonna be rather general, and, and as I kind of ask the Lord in our prayer for some reminders, um, uh, some of these things I, I know we've heard before, um, uh, but we do need to be reminded of them. Uh, so anyway, politics is our topic, and really this should be a, a common sense topic for believers. There's a great deal of, of scripture that can guide us in how we respond to nas national policies and national leaders, okay? But oddly enough, we, we, get, we get carried away sometimes, don't we? Um, we <laughs> Jeff's like, no, not me. Um, we do. We, 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 anyway, we get carried away. We, we look at politics sometimes as the end all of things, and it's not. However, politicians, policies, they do exist. We're not going to agree with them all, but there is a, a biblical way to, to respond to them. Here's how uh, Webster defined politics in his 1828 dictionary. Politics is the science of government, that part of ethics which consists in the consists in the regulation and governing of a nation or state for, uh, you're not writing this down, right? Okay, because I'm almost done. You, you don't need to write it down. You look it up later. But anyway, I just want to start with the definition. But it's that, it's that part of ethics, politics is that part of ethics which consists in the regulation and governing of a nation or state for the preservation of its safety, peace, and prosperity. That's how Webster defined politics back in 1828. So right in its definition, we see that its purpose is supposed to be based in ethics. What is ethics? Okay, and, and th that's connected. I, I, integrity would be a good word for what you just said there. So it's connected to that. But ethics is really, it's about what's right and what is wrong and, and doing, doing what is right, okay? You, you have to know what is right before you can do what is right, for sure, for sure. So politics is supposed to be 
or supposed to ethically preserve a, a nation's safety, its peace, and its prosperity. Is, is that what politics is accomplishing right now? <laughs> no? Okay, that was kind of overwhelming, all right. Um, is it the science's fault or man's fault? All right, okay. Um, the fact of the matter is politics and politicians, policy th th themselves, put it this way, politics, probably better put politicians, while they are supposed to be there to, to provide safety and peace and, and allow for prosperity, um, the politicians themselves are at war. They're at war. They have created really an unsafe environment uh, that is robbing us of, of peace in many, in many cases um, and prosperity. In this country, uh, both sides of the, the aisle okay, are, are guilty in areas to the degree that politicians and politics have now become a derogatory term, right? Um, that should not change though how we as believers in Christ, children of God, respond to those people that he has placed in leadership, uh, those policies that he has allowed them to put in place. Now, I must say that in comparison to other countries um, and either, even other times in our own country, it, it is more peaceful than other places. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys have uh, watched what goes on in parliament or, or political gatherings in other countries, but literally there are places where fistfights are, are not uncommon. Um, just, just recently, Taiwan, Mexico, Ukraine, and Turkey. You can find them, the videos on YouTube, fistfights breaking out in their, in their um, political gatherings. Uh, well, even in, in this country, back in 1858, the U.S. House of Representatives, February 6th, erupted in an all-out brawl. They were debating the, uh, the um, Kansas Territory's pro-slavery constitution. It went into the late hours of the night and at 2 a.m. and I'm, I'm thinking probably a lack of sleep had, had something to do with this. All of a sudden, there were 30 representatives in an all-out brawl, right? Right in our own, our own um, government. And uh, James Orr gaveled furiously trying to stop everybody. He told the sergeant in arms, arrest anybody who isn't compliant. And again, all-out brawl, anti-slavery Republicans beating up pro-slavery Democrats. It all finally dissolved. They laughed it off and went back to work. All right. But anyway, it, that was temporary, by the way, because three years later, we were in a civil war. <laughs> but anyway, how does, how does politics, uh, that, that is the science of ethically preserving safety, peace, and prosperity, how does something like that turn into something dangerous Greed. and divisive? Greed, Greed. okay. Ego. Yeah. Ego, sin, selfishness, right? All right. I'm right and you're wrong and you got two parties or more saying that, and there you go. Well, when it comes down to the world's view of politics, here's our first, oh, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep bumping that, Bob, sorry about that. First of our, our four-part outline tonight, uh, the world's view of politics oftentimes is, I'm right and you're wrong. And, and that's it, they, they, they kind of take a stand there and you know, obviously compromise happens, but it's usually when a, enough uh, 
other stuff is packed in that can benefit both sides that it happens. But really, it comes down to the world's view of politics being, I, I'm right and, and you're wrong. And, and I've thought kind of long and hard about how to word the world's view as I'm right and you're wrong. But, and and I, as I decided on that, the reason I did is because anytime anyone says, I'm right and you're wrong, um, they're wrong. <laughs> Whoever says that, I'm right and you're, you're wrong, they're wrong. Why is that? Think about what I said. If I say, I'm right and you're wrong, you're I'm wrong. Okay, I'm being judgmental. Prideful. Ron? You're giving a definitive answer, whereas in most of these issues, there is no right Okay, answer. okay. Any other thoughts on that? What, what, what about, uh, well, I'll tell you what. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 9. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 9. should know where Jeremiah is, right? Been there a few times lately. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord... Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So when somebody says, I'm right and you're wrong, and, and they remove basically God from the equation, they are wrong. Um, even, and I'll, I'll just share this with you, even when I share the, the gospel, I try to avoid saying things like, this is what I think, or or this is what I believe, and rather say, this is what God says, okay? And, and that's why I believe it. Th this is what God says. So politics, I'm right and you're wrong, anybody that, 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 that says I'm right is technically in the wrong because it's, it's really not, they're not the source of right and wrong, God is. Um, there are many on both sides of any given, given issue that have taken a worldly view. They, they're in the wrong if they're, if they're not doing things God's way. Um, since the beginning of time, uh, God has sought to teach man that without me, you, you can do nothing. And every single time that man has, ha has done things man's way, what happened? It, it failed, right? It failed miserably. What happened when Adam and Eve were convinced that God was withholding something from them? Plunged us, plunged us into our, our sin nature, didn't it? What happened when Cain thought that, that God and his, his, uh, his offering system was wrong? Ended up killing his brother Abel. Uh, when when, when uh, the world thought God was wrong during Noah's time, God destroyed it. So on and on and on. We see this through, through history that, that when man is the source of, of right and wrong, he's wrong. Um, in John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me 
you can do nothing. And, and any, any worldview that, that eliminates God from the equation, uh, when they say, I'm right and you're wrong, they're going to end up being wrong. All right, so the, the world's view of politics is oftentimes, it's very polarizing, okay? I'm right and you're wrong. The world's response in politics then is do things my way. All right, that, that, that's, that's the driving force. We want to do things my way. Since I'm right and you're wrong, we need to do things my way because my way is best. And if, and if, I, if we have two sides that think their way is best, rather than getting safety, peace, and prosperity, we're going to get division and danger. And uh, just so you know, uh, until God... Jesus Christ is ruling here on earth in person, um, division and danger will not go away. All right, it's going to be there. It's going to be the norm. But this, 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 uh, this lesson is not about fixing the world, okay, or about curing uh, politics. It's about the biblical view and our response to, to policies and, and politicians, people who, who think uh, they are right and want their way. But man's way uh, will always fail. And here is why. Um, man's ways will always have a flawed means. Man's ways will always have a, a flawed means. Um, there are some good goals in the world, aren't there? I mean, doesn't people in the world have some good goals? What are some good goals that the world has? Jeff? Feeding the poor. Okay, feeding the poor. Eliminating poverty. Eliminating poverty. Clean, up pollution. Clean up pollution, okay. What do beauty pageant contestants always say? World peace. World peace. Good goals, good goals to have. Um, we talked about racism and racism. It's a, it's a good goal. Preservation of the species, making our planet more more livable. How does the world seek to accomplish these things? The first they form a committee. Okay, a committee. <laughs> I think I've been on a few of those committees. But. No, all right, so how, how does the world seek to accomplish world peace? What's one way they've Let's tried? Vote, vote, all right. Well, they tried the United Nations. Okay, United Nations. They usually wage war to find peace. Okay, wage war to find peace. That's right. Treaties, right? Mm -hmm. Peace treaties, all right. Um, redistrib redistribution of wealth to end poverty. Ron? They basically try to do it through their own wisdom. Okay. And my, my point being, man's ways will always be flawed. Now we're looking at some of man's ways, uh, peace treaties, uh, United Nations, okay? Um, redistribution of wealth. Um, protesting, violence, education. This is how the world, okay, man's ways of, of doing it. Eula? Jesus said you will always have the poor with you. Yes, we will always have the poor until, until we're in his eternal kingdom. So the world is seeking to accomplish these good goals. Um, how's the treaty thing worked out? All right, not, not, not so well. Um, can you think of any countries in which poverty has been eliminated through the redistributing of wealth? No, no. Ma man's ways are flawed. Um, I've heard many, in, even in this country, say, well, that country didn't do it right. They need to do it 
my way, <laughs> right? And we come right back to the, the problem here. So man's ways will always have a flawed means. Man's ways will always have selfish motives. Um, go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and let's just look at verse 5. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. See, until a person comes to a place where they, they know God, love God, and have the Spirit, they, they're operating completely in the flesh. And because of that, their motives, their motives will always be about what's in it for me. They'll always be selfish. In fact, James 3, 16 says, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So, Man's ways will always have selfish motives. Man's ways will always be, uh, two ways I'm going I'm to put this, childish, but we're going to see another word come out here in just a minute if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Man's ways will always be childish, but uh, Paul uses a little bit different terminology in connection to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. So why, why what, it, what is it about the Corinthians that are making them childish? Jeff? Okay, they were spiritual, spiritual babies and still acting like they did before they knew the Lord. And they, they weren't utilizing the spirit that they had in them. Paul's talking to a church that was very, very immature. And without the spirit, man's ways will always be childish, carnal. Why is he calling them? Well, let's go, let me kind of answer that question already. Look at verse 3. He says, for you are still carnal, for where there is envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So he's telling them they're, they're behaving like the the, the natural man, the people that aren't new creations in Christ. That's how they're acting. So man's ways will always be childish. Um, what are some things that children do when they don't get their way? You're going to give someone else a chance, Jeff. Dave, throw a tantrum. Okay. Anything else? They They cry. They manipulate. Do they ever rebel? They rebel. Screaming is always good. Destruction. All right. You guys know this well. <laughs> Are we seeing any of those things in our country today? All right, all of the above, all of the above. Um, it's childish. Quite frankly, we've seen these, well, here, here's a couple other things. Name calling, right? Kids do name calling. Um, and that's, that's one thing that I haven't appreciated even about our president. He, he likes to do name calling. And that, that's childish. That's childish. But that's the world's response. That's the world's response. Man's ways will always be flawed, selfish, and childish, and man's ways will always lead to nothing good. 
they will always lead to nothing good. No matter how good the goal is, man's ways won't lead to anything good. If you're still in 1 Corinthians 3, look at verses 20 and then the beginning of verse 21. It says, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. And he's talking about the wise of the world here. Therefore, let no one boast in men. Let no one boast in, in men. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 26, 12 says, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. So we've seen the, the world's view, and again, this is very general, I know. It's very general. The world's view of politics, in a sense, is I'm right and you're wrong. The world's response is do things my way. So now let's look at the biblical view. The biblical view is, and I'm just going to ask, any, any guesses? If, if the, the world's view is do things my way, what might the biblical view be? Do things God's way. That's right. And, and not only in, 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 in policies, but in responding to politicians. Um, because God's way is always right. It's always right. God's way is, will never have a, a, a selfish motive. Um, Proverbs 1427. Let's turn there for a minute. Proverbs 1427. It says, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Um, God's way never has, that doesn't seem like the right verse. Proverbs 14, 27. Yeah, God's way prospers and protects us. His way is not for selfish motives. It doesn't seem like the verse I wanted, but it fits kind of. All right. <laughs> Either way, God's way is, never has selfish motives. God's way never has a flawed means. Um, Psalm 18. In verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. So what, what, what do you suppose that means that it is proven, do you think? He's never okay, he, he's, he's never wrong. But in, in regard to God's way never has a flawed means... Any ideas of what that proving is referring to? Has God's means ever failed? No, it's never failed. And I, and I think that's what that's referring to. Um, verse 30 again, it says, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to all who trust in him. His way is never, never going to be flawed. It's always going to work exactly how he wants it to, and that, that's why we should trust in him. God's way always leads to something good, and we'll turn to Romans 8, a familiar verse. Romans 8. And verse 28, it says, And we know that all things 
work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now from this verse, for whom does all things work together for good? Ah, to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose, his, his way of doing things. And it will work together. God's way always leads, always leads to something good. And then God's ways are, are never like man's. Um, let's look at a few more verses here, and then we'll, we'll talk about a few things. Um, Numbers 23 and verse 19. Numbers 23 and verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and, it will, and, he, and, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? So, God's ways are, are not like man's. He, he doesn't lie. He doesn't have selfish motives. He doesn't have a flawed means. It'll always lead to something good. And that is completely opposite to uh, the way of, of man. Uh, one more passage here, Isaiah 55. And verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 55 and verses 8 and 9. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts uh, than your thoughts. So, from that verse in particular, what does it teach us about God's thoughts and ways as compared to man's? All right. Really, they don't compare, right? There is no comparison to the way God operates and the way man does. And as a result of that, um, as we respond to or our view of politicians and policies, okay, should be grounded right in what God's word. And, and, and I hope, I hope that is, it is a reminder for you, okay? While man's ways are always flawed, always selfish, always childish, they lead to nothing good, God's ways are never flawed, never selfish, never childish, and always lead to something good. So the biblical view is God is right. So that has to be the base of the policies that we support. And ideally, we'd love it to be the base of the, the politicians we support. Uh, that's a rare thing. But anyway, the biblical response then is to do things God's way. And we're going to look now more at our response to politicians and policies for a few minutes. In fact, I have a, a list of about 10 biblical responses that we should have toward politics. And um, if our life is going to matter to those around us, and, and it can, even in the area of policies and politicians and how we respond to them, we must respond uh, the way God wants us to respond. Our godly lives do matter to those around us, even in this area. And just uh, a forewarning, um, some of these things may be convicting, all right? Um, you and I are, are probably going to hear some things that, that we, we may not want to hear. 
Uh, but anyway, 10 things here. Number one, do not conform to the world. Do not conform to the world. If the world's view or response is, is different from that of God's, don't conform to it. Um, don't take their view. Don't stoop to their level. Don't use their tactics. Don't be selfish. Don't be childish. Uh, Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um, as we... As we refuse to conform to the ways of the world, um, it, will, it will demonstrate not only God's will in our own life, but could even demonstrate to others how, how perfect his will is. So don't conform to the world. Secondly, put the spiritual well-being of others ahead of our rights. Put the spiritual well-being of others ahead of our rights. Uh, let's turn to another passage, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 says... Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." Now, from this passage, did Christ have the right to stay on his throne in heaven? Yes. He did. Did he stay on his throne in heaven? He did not. For what did he give up that right? For our spiritual well-being. Um, should we have that same mind? Okay. Uh, does this mean we should not exercise our spiritual or national rights? No, of, co of course not. Of course not. No, it just means that if it comes down to the spiritual well-being of another or the exercising of my rights, uh, their spiritual well-being should be our priority. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.23, Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Not all things are, are build, can build other people up. Uh, we could probably come up with, with thousands of scenarios that would fit into that. Here's just one. I have the, the national right to free speech but it may not be profitable for me to exercise that right as a, as a heckler at a political event, all right? Or to demonstrate and protest at an abortion clinic. That may not be the most profitable thing I could do. I, I, wonder, I wonder sometimes, and this is just a, a wondering of mine, because I know how I feel about some of the things I've seen but I wonder sometimes if any hearts have ever been changed as a result of a protest. I, you know, and I don't know. I don't know, but I wonder as I watch, especially the protests that are taking place right now, um, for the most part, they, they irritate me and maybe even make me more opposed than I was. So I, I wonder, I wonder sometimes if any hearts have ever been changed by a, a protest. Laws may have been changed, but I don't know about hearts. 
put the spiritual well-being of others ahead of our, our rights. So on the flip side of that, rightly, this is number three, rightly exercise your rights of citizenship. And I, and I kind of doubled up on the word rightly there, but rightly exercise your rights. In other words, in other words there is a, a wrong way to exercise our rights. So we need to rightly exercise them. Uh, that means exercising them um, not in a rebellious way. Uh, we do have spiritual and national rights that can be exercised. The right to worship, the right to assemble, the right to free speech, the right to bear arms, the right to vote. And these rights, these are rights that we should exercise rightly. Um, in our country, we still have the right to determine the laws of the land. Uh, we as believers have the right through the court system, through our vote, to influence policy that can honor God. We have the right to a, a fair trial. In the Roman Empire of Paul's day, uh, Roman citizens were innocent until proven guilty. But in Acts chapter 22, as the apostle Paul was bound and taken captive by Roman soldiers, and as they were about to scourge him before a trial, Paul said this in Acts 22, 25, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Paul was a Roman citizen. They did arrest him. They did take him away. He didn't rebel. He didn't fight. But when the time was right, he exercised his right rightly. Okay? And he was actually released because he, he rightly exercised his right. So, number three is rightly exercise your rights, rights of citizenship. Uh, number four, obey the authorities. And we've touched on this in several of our topics already. Obey the authorities. Romans 13, 1 and 2 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Paul, as he was arrested, he didn't resist the authorities. He went through the proper channels as a citizen. Number five, this one you're not going to like. Pay your taxes. <laughs> Pay your taxes. Turn to Matthew 22, please. Matthew 22, verses 15 through 21. It says, And the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk, speaking of Jesus. And they said to him, it is said to him, and they sent to him, <laughs> Their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about any do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. All right, we'll just stop there. Again, Jesus endorsing the paying of taxes. But here's a question for you. And he did endorse the paying of taxes. But do you think that some of that tax money was going to ungodly policies? Okay. 
it, it's still right to, to pay our taxes. Um, number six, promote and support godly policies. They're rare, I know. But promote and support godly policies. We do have a voice. We can, as a citizen, speak up. We can vote. We can run for office. Promote and support godly policies. Number seven, do not compromise with ungodly policies. And again, this is how, this is the biblical way to respond to those in office and the policies that they have. We don't have to compromise with them. Not only should we not conform to the way of the world, we don't have to do what they're doing, all right? And certainly we don't have to compromise with what they're doing. Uh, James 4.4 4 says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world, makes himself an enemy of God. Um, right in our own Nevada ballot this year, there was a proposed amendment to our, to reword our constitution so that marriage could be redefined and not limited to a man and a woman. That was on our, our ballot this year. And the third point of that proposed amendment was that people like me uh, could still have the right to refuse to marry a same-sex couple and not have legal action taken against us. So they were asking in that, that amendment for a, a compromise. If, if you'll Vote this way, this is what we'll give you, all right? They're asking for a compromise. If you'll agree to redefine marriage, we'll give you the right to refuse. Well, I have to tell you, that's a, that's a trick question. I already have the right to refuse. <laughs> I already have that right, okay? Biblically and constitutionally, and that amendment, even if it passed, and I don't know how many rounds it's actually got to go, but it did pass, pass the first round, okay? Uh, yes, it did. Um, that am amendment isn't going to stop people from pursuing legal action against me, all right? Um, but anyway, don't compromise ungodly prince, uh, with, with ungodly policies. Number eight, pray for the saints. We have brothers and sisters all over our country and all over the world that are facing things, politicians and policies that are much more, much more opposed <laughs> to Christianity than what we're experiencing. There was a fancier word I had in my mind, but I couldn't spit it out, all right? Pray for the saints. Ephesians 6, 18 and 19, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. So a couple things that Paul's asking prayer for here is that, is that, Perseverance for the saints, but specifically in, in, in sharing the gospel, the truth of God's word. Okay? All the saints, Paul, speak the truth of the gospel, even in the face of the devil's attacks. So prayer for the saints. Number nine, pray for all in leadership. Pray for all in leadership. And this will be the last verse we're going to look at, but 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, I exert, exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, 
that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness with reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, our our godly lives, they, they do matter in our country, in our community. Our prayers for all the people, our prayers for leadership, they, they can play a part in, in those people coming to a place of, of knowing the truth, coming to a place where, where they do things God's way. And I'm going to name some names here, but when was the last time you prayed for President Trump or Vice President Pence? Every day. day. All right. When was the last time you prayed for Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, and Bernie Sanders? Okay. They need our prayers. What's that? <laughs> they need our prayers. When was the last time we prayed for them or, or for their, their salvation? Who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? When was the last time we, we prayed for the, what is it, the, the squad? What's the... <laughs> All right, I was going to, I can't pronounce half their names, so I just thought I'd say that, okay? Um, what is it? AOC. Right, I, I had hers, Alexander Cortez, down. When was the last time you prayed for Steve Sisolak? I mean, there are other influential people in the world, too, that, that need the Lord, and they're very influential. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg. Elon Musk, George Soros. They need the Lord. They need the Lord. And they would not be the most wicked people that have ever trusted Christ. Told you it'd be a little convicting. And and it it was for me. Um, But anyway, I exhort you, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We can even give thanks for people in this list. God has them there for a purpose. God's in control. We can be thankful for that, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who does desire that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Number 10, and this one's obvious. In fact, this one I think this one has probably come up in just about every topic so far as far as a a biblical response to the contemporary issue that we're looking at. It's about changing hearts, so we need to share the gospel. We need to share the gospel. Politics will not fix the world, ever. Um, But God can change a heart, and only God can change a heart. And therefore, godly change can happen in our world as individual hearts are changed by him. And that's why we must be godly examples of godly standards with a gracious, godly message. All right, any questions or thoughts, Gary? I was hoping you'd bring up Ecclesiastes 10.2. Tell me what that says. In this country, we, in most countries, we call our politicians left and right. And God says, the heart of the wise inclined to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 
All right, I, I, I don't know that God had politics in mind there, but yeah, all right, very good. Any other questions or thoughts? All right. Well, thank you for bearing with us tonight. Lord willing, next week, we're going to look at, at climate change. And actually, the next, the next three that I got lined up, I'm, I'm much more excited. I, I was excited about politics, but it's not, your, it, it, it's not typically a, a, a topic that would draw a crowd, you know. But uh, the next three, I'm, I'm really excited about them. But next week, Lord willing, um, climate change. So let's close in prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, we do thank you for the guidance of your word, uh, your teacher, the spirit inside of us. And, and I do pray, Lord, that as we looked at this, uh, this contemporary issue of, of politicians and policies, I, I do pray that in our heart, Deep in our heart, Lord, we would respond the way you want us to respond. Um, thank you in Jesus' name.